Welcome. Civil society is a moderated discussion exploring significant issues confronting our communities. We hope you find civil society informative and inspirational and that you'll encourage others to view our program on ACC TV Channel 19, on YouTube, and on our website, nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. By advancing civil dialogue and greater awareness of the critical role nonprofits play in our communities, we honor the passion, persistence, and life-changing results of those who make our community stronger, more inclusive, and more vibrant. Produced by the Center for Nonprofit Studies in association with Distance Learning Media, Civil Society offers you the opportunity to learn more and participate in continuing discussion through our website. Welcome to Civil Society. I'm your host, Julie Niehoff, and today we're taking on a dark and sometimes difficult subject to talk about, and that is sex trafficking in Central Texas. It's a real problem in many cities across the country, including right here in Austin. In fact, a recent study published by the University of Texas estimates that there are 79,000 youth and minor victims of sex trafficking in Texas alone. Our guest today will help us shed light on some of the people and organizations here in Central Texas that are working toward real solutions. A lot of people have misconceptions about what child sex trafficking is. Most people think trafficking happens in other countries and other parts of the world. But the reality is that child sex trafficking goes on right here in our country and it's our children that are being trafficked. So we're seeing an increase in traffickers using technology to lure, recruit, groom children, um, blackmail them into sex trafficking. Most of the cases that we investigate involve children anywhere from 13 to 17 years old. We're hearing reports out of Houston that gangs are recruiting kids into sex trafficking from middle schools. And the way they're doing it is that they're gang raping these children in middle schools, videotaping it, and then using the videotape to say to this victim, this is who you are now. This is what you will do for us, or this video will go viral. We have limited options when we recover juveniles in our investigations of what we can do with them and where we can take them. So a place like the refuge is, is an ideal situation for us to have a place that truly cares uh, about these girls, about their well-being, and they're trained and set up to help them deal with their past trauma to reduce the chances that they're going to be exploited again in the future. Our first guest is a local phenomenon of sorts, having launched a one-woman mission to build a private ranch and recovery facility for victims of sex trafficking right here in Texas. Her name is Brooke Crowder. She's the founder and executive director of The Refuge Ranch. Brooke, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Civil Society. So I want you to first tell me about the ranch. Tell me about the refuge. The refuge is a long-term therapeutic ranch in Bastrop County. It's currently being constructed um, on 50 beautiful acres that were donated to us by a family here in Austin. Oh, that's nice. Yes, and um, we will be a, a, a refuge for girls that have been rescued out of sex trafficking, minors, girls ages 11 to 17. And how did you get started? on this road? Uh, I, I got started in 2004 while I was working on a master's degree and I saw a video of little girls being rescued out of a brothel mm -hmm. and these little girls were being bought and sold for sex. They were five, six, seven years old and it literally broke my heart and at the time my daughter was the same age and I just decided if this were really going on in the world today uh, and it could happen to my daughter, then I wanted to do something about it. And it was a calling for me from that point on to find out how I could do something to help 
You know, situation. I, I've had that moment, meaning I've seen those videos or videos like that, mm -hmm. probably not the same one you saw, but, and I know people who have, and we, we all have the conversation of something needs to be done about this, but what is it about you that took the next step and said, no, really, something has to be done and actually started doing things? That's almost a hard question to, <laughs> to answer, but I think at the end of the day, I, I, I feel like I've been put on earth to uh, have my life count for something and make a difference, and this clearly was something that I knew uh, because we had all the resources in our community to help these children if I just got some folks together and um, organized around this cause, we could make a difference, and um, it's at the end of the day, it's on our watch as adults, mm. and this is our time to do something about what I consider to be an epidemic of sorts. Well, let me ask you this. Did you have any experience running a nonprofit organization? I have always been in nonprofit work of some sort. As far as running one, no, but leading up to this time, um, I've worked with several different types of nonprofits that I do think gave me experience and equipped me to then go ahead and start one and, and when you it. say sex trafficking can you give me a, a very clear definition because it means different things to different people and we aren't all talking about the same thing all the time right so when we talk about sex trafficking the refuge and um, we are specifically talking about children that are being bought and sold for sex and for some type of exchange of any kind of good so whether that's money drugs shelter food clothing um, it's ex an exploitation of their body for sex. Wow. And I know I've been at, a, at an event where you were speaking and, and some of the things you talked about changed my perception of the, of the issue. And that you talked about the difference between the way this issue is described in headlines, maybe referring to a victim as a prostitute or a young prostitute or even worse, a child prostitute, right. which makes no sense, mm -hmm. um, versus the way that you message it. And I wonder if you'll talk about that a little bit and the way that you try to change the way that we're all thinking about this topic. Yeah, well, to your point, so often in years past, you would see headlines that would tell, call these children that were being exploited child prostitutes, as though it was a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having language that turns that around to say this is actually a child who at no fault of their own um, were caught up in something very evil um, that truly is exploiting them in the worst possible way. So really looking at the heart of a child when we talk about this situation and also talking about when we're wanting to make changes, we don't talk about changing the system. We talk about the child that's caught up in that system. How can people help you help these children? What can people do to help the refuge? Well, there's just so many ways. I think first and foremost, um, really understanding this is going on right here. And, and right here in Austin, it surprised me. Right here in Austin, in, in actually huge numbers, Austin. Austin's really kind of the center of uh, the activity that's going on in Texas between yeah. Dallas, Houston, Especially with all of our big events, South by Southwest, right. F1, ACL, that's bringing large people. The way I understand it, that's also changing supply and demand. I hate to use that word, but. No, well, it is. That's the bottom line, unfortunately, mm -hmm. is that it's a supply and demand. Yeah. Um, but by. Uh, really accepting that this is going on, then that alone, that the horror of that would, I hope, cause everyone to decide, I can do something, I can do one thing, whether that's a skill set that you have that you could provide services at the refuge for children, um, whether that's hosting a gathering and educating your neighbors and coworkers about this going on because the reality is this could go on in your neighborhood. This could be your child. Sure, every neighborhood. Right. And we're going to keep this conversation going. I hope you'll stay. We're going to add a few people to the topic, uh, to the panel, so we can talk a little bit more about the refuge and some other organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also want to point out that Texas, according to the recent study by the University of Texas, is ranked number two in the country for the amount of sex trafficking that's happening with our children. So I, I don't think it's something we can ignore, and I, I welcome the other panelists to come and talk about this topic and see if we can do more to help. Now we're joined by two more guests. Tony McKinley is a survivor of trafficking who now spends her time and energy counseling victims at the refuge. And Sandra Molinari with SAFE, 
an organization that is long focused on the needs of women and children in crisis, but you have recently added services for victims of sex trafficking to your mission. Isn't that right? That's right. Um, so Safe Stop Abuse for Everyone is a merger of Austin Children's Shelter and Safe Place. And our mission is to lead in ending sexual assault and exploitation, child abuse, and domestic violence. Wow. We do that through prevention services, intervention, and advocacy for change. Okay, so do you think that that's a sign of growth in general of the problem or just more awareness of the problem? I think that's definitely more an awareness of the problem. Um, certainly on the Safe Place Campus side of things, we've been seeing over the years survivors of trafficking not identifying as such when they come in, but as they've been coming in for perhaps domestic violence or sexual assault and other circumstances, after getting to know the survivors, things are coming up that are leading us to believe that they are victims of sex trafficking. So they're realizing after the fact, so there's been a yes. crisis and then over time with your organization, right. they're right. realizing. Right, with us helping them perhaps see what some of the signs are. If they didn't identify them, we will say, I'm concerned about what you're saying, about these things that happened to you, that sounds like, and some people might identify it or not, but we've definitely seen that. Wow, so then you had to change your mission and expand so then we it. So changed our wow. mission, and, and working much more closely with Austin Children's Shelter, and now in a merger, we were seeing a lot of domestic minor sex trafficking on the side of the youth at Austin Children's Shelter as well. It sadly gives us a reason to be here. Absolutely. And Tony, let me ask you, um, because you um, have actually been on the other side of mm -hmm. the situation, I want to get your opinion on this. When I was preparing for the show, mm -hmm. I was reading a lot of reports reports um, and one of the things that surprised me that I learned is so many victims who are presented with the opportunity for help mm -hmm. will return to their trafficker mm -hmm. and I wanted to see if you could share some insight about that yeah well there's a lot of different reasons why that happens and one of them is just the trauma that happens um, what happens to the brain when you experience trauma um, and a child's brain isn't developed and mature enough to really understand what's going on and she truly believes that this man loves her, is going to take care of her, and you have to understand that these girls are coming from um, being abused by all different kinds of people, and in a lot of cases even their own family members. So it's, they really don't know who to trust, um, who to turn to, who's going to really take care of them. Um, they've been thrown in and out of children's homes or foster care um, and have run away from those situations because of various reasons, whether um, it was um, because they just are dying for relationships with people and they're struggling with connecting sure. with the people that are taking care of them or they're in an abusive situation again. So it's, um, it's very, very difficult f to understand why they do that unless you're really in that position to really get it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Exactly. It makes sense. Yeah. So I also read that 500 Austin police officers have been trained uh, much like we are hearing in the news that uh, flight attendants have been trained uh -huh. to recognize the signs of a victim in front of them and to intervene and and actually one of them five days after being trained actually um, recognized the, the signs in a girl in a traffic stop and, and uh -huh. rescued her. Um, what are the signs? Now, I think the, the greatest sign really is the older man with the younger child um, and not assuming that that's her father and especially looking at the way she's behaving, maybe looking down, not looking at people, um, could be dressed up um, to a point, you know, how a child shouldn't be dressed. Um, those are a couple of the big signs to really look for that people can watch out for as they're traveling or just in their na their neighborhood, in their area. Um, I've seen girls, you know, where I live, um, who look like that, and you see them get in a car with another man, and they're just kind of look way overdressed to be walking down the street, right? Sure. Um, and so those are some of the big signs to look for. We have heard stories of girls that are living at home and being trafficked after school mm -hmm. and their families don't even know about it. Right. And so for families, some signs are things like maybe a new tattoo mm -hmm. or new clothing that they did not purchase or a decrease in grades and relationships within the family and, and siblings. So a change in behavior and some of these other signs could note that they're being exploited as well. As a parent, as a concerned family friend, mm -hmm. as a relative, as 
as a neighbor, what do you do? Yeah, well, I'm you talk, <laughs> talk to your daughter. If, if you suspect something's different, you're gonna know your daughter's behavior is changing more than anyone else. And it really is a drastic change. You're gonna see a change in friendships, a change, a change in crowds that she's been around. She'll drop out of things that she's been involved in, whether it's sports or other extracurricular activities. All of a sudden, if you're, um, if she's involved in a youth group, she's going to start, you know, talking down about those people because all of a sudden she's not going to relate to them anymore, and she's going to feel judged. So she's going to start with a drawing from from these healthy relationships that she was in. When you start seeing those drastic changes, it may or may not mean that she's trafficked, but it does mean that something's going on, and it's something very serious. And so. Getting her help either through through counseling if she'll talk. I mean, that's a really difficult one um, and um, real Monitoring you know, what what is she doing cracking into her her? Um, social media mm -hmm. talking to her friends the kids know what's going on more than what we know Even if they aren't really that great friends anymore They hear things they know things and they can give you some insight into what may be going on to try to help your daughter Wow, okay, mm -hmm. and what about at, at safe? Um, uh, Tony was mentioning like social media and things. Is that something that you're having to jump into because they're coming to you in a crisis situation So they're not typically bringing their cell phone. Am I right or am I wrong? You know we allow youth their freedom with their cell phones But it, I think it comes back to what both Tony and Brooke were saying it, it's about having conversations This is about pointing out this is where I'm concerned about what I'm seeing mm -hmm. It's about building trust which I think is yeah. really really key building yeah. trust between um, in our case, the staff and the young people around their relationships, or building trust in general so that you can talk about relationships. So how's that going for you? Um, maybe having conversations about, about what healthy relationships look like mm -hmm. because of course, uh, young people who are being trafficked are often referring to those traffickers as their boyfriends. Mm -hmm. So not saying, no, this is a pimp, saying or a trafficker, saying, so tell me about your boyfriend and mm -hmm. what kinds of things do you do and what does a healthy relationship look like and kind of getting at that and helping them see some things that might not be so healthy as opposed to targeting them as victims because most victims won't hear that. This is a huge problem. The number I read is 79,000. Right. Um, how do we scale the situation because I know the solution is talking and building trust mm -hmm. with these victims and there's got to be an, an element of law enforcement at some point sure. on the demand side but from where we are coming from for the solution how do you scale that or do you can you do you have any thoughts on that I think you can I think you um, have to address it from the entire continuum um, in every community with meaning you begin with prevention yes. and that's e education at a young age yes. and really accepting in every community this is going on in your community yeah. all the way to the end result where we um, have children that are in long-term care and then transitioning into a new life after that care so that's the continuum and everything in between it has to be in many ways a coordinated effort if we just are doing one thing it really falls apart for the child and so um, it's it's good that we're having these conversations um, in in our communities more and more, but at the end of the day, we're not we're not doing enough yet. Obviously, seventy nine thousand. I would say um, absolutely that it, it needs to. We need comprehensive solutions. We need to, to to address prevention. And if we're looking at prevention, we need to look at cycles of vulnerability because these are vulnerable people. And in our case, where we're working also with adult survivors of trafficking, we have to look at why are people falling into this life, or why are they being, or why are they prey to this life. The so big what, question. The, bi the bigger question, right? So it goes into interpersonal relationships and how we treat people with respect from a very young age but all the way up about healthy relationships in our communities. It's thinking about uh, affordable housing. So why is it that adults go into are sometimes trafficked or commercially sexually exploited? Maybe because there aren't other options and it's, it's easy to fall prey to somebody who's going to love you, help you with housing. Um, when we don't have fair wages and a lot of other jobs, people fall prey to exploitation. So we need to look overall and what are we doing as a society and how are we treating people and how can we address ways so that people don't aren't so vulnerable so vulnerable at, at all ages. I think. And it's expensive. It's, it's expensive to get these services to the people that need them and the training that you're talking about, not just 
to the victims and their families, but to teachers and flight attendants and police officers. Yes. It apparently costs our state $6.6 .6 billion annually right. to mm -hmm. address mm -hmm. just the right. training and the services that people need. What do you say to people that point out that at least in Austin, we have huge events, and Brooke and I talked about this a little bit earlier, like South by Southwest, like F1, um, Austin City Limits Festival, and, and more, you know, it's a growing, burgeoning, thriving tourist destination. Mm -hmm. um, with that, sadly, comes the growth of this market. Um, when commerce is involved, when we have that level of expense to address it, and we have people that are exploiting the situation for financial gain, where do you see the city's role in addressing that? Well, I think um, funding the issue and would help a lot. There's a um, there's not enough of that going on to get all the education out there that's needed, all the money that this is costing our state. Um, we really need um, to have organizations and um, the government come in and just help and not just pass laws, but also come be back behind those and stand up behind those laws and enforce those laws mm -hmm. and make sure that these children are getting the funding that's needed in order to get them the healing and making sure that children are getting the funding that's needed in order to prevent them from from being able from from getting caught up in this life absolutely and so and, and the it, education yeah. Sandra's I, I know you a lot of your role is in education mm -hmm. and making sure people are learning about the things mm -hmm. that Tony's talking about um, and that's part of the answer, if not the answer. I don't want to end this conversation feeling overwhelmed by the number, overwhelmed by the cost, and overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. I want to know that what each of you is doing, mm -hmm. which I know has impact, can, can lift me up so that I can raise my hand and carry more water and our viewers can raise their hands and carry more water. So can you, any of you, give yeah. me hope? Yeah, I mean, I speak about this all over the place. and. Most of the time when I'm speaking, we're finding a girl who's been trafficked and helping her get out of it. But the, the, the hopeful side of that is, is not only we're finding them, but we're finding girls who are being manipulated before they're trafficked. Um, their, their friends are coming and listening and saying, I have a friend that has an older boyfriend. I never knew that this might be a problem. You know, and they're covering for each other. So if kids know that they may never see their friend again, if they don't speak up and violate their trust, um, then we'll, they won't ever see their friend again. But if they know this information, they are talking. They're so you're talking seeing every. That oh, definitely, you're that when you definitely. Go. It doesn't. It, at almost every time that I speak somewhere, I'm getting a phone call before I even get home of someone saying. I think I know someone who's being trafficked. So we need to send Tony out every day. <laughs> right. And then that's 365 people that we can handle. Yeah. Any, any you phone, Tony. Yeah. Well, Do you have uh, any stories of hope? I have a ton of hope in regards to just this issue being at the forefront of our um, community efforts. And we've seen the community step up in ways that um, are, it's hopeful and it's mm -hmm. encouraging. And I think if we do it together as yes. a community, then we can make a big difference in yeah. regards to this. And that's the key you. right there, is doing it together as a community. Right. right? We mm -hmm. really, really need, we can't do this alone. Other people can't do it alone. We've got to come together as a community. Like we are here coming together to discuss this topic um, to help help these children and help prevent this from happening to others. Sandra, if someone is a victim of violence or it finds themselves in crisis or realizes that they're part of a sex, of a sex trafficking situation, what should they do if they need help? Uh, they should call 512-267-SAFE and that's 512-267-7233. We have a 24-hour hotline. Regardless of their immigration status? We do not ask anybody's immigration status. We serve absolutely everyone who is a victim and we do not ask for proof of them being a victim. We do not ask for police reports on any of these crimes. If the person seeks to make a police report, we honor that, but if they do not choose to, we will serve them regardless. Thank you for sharing that. And Brooke, I understand that the refuge is not something where a victim will raise their hand and say, I want to come to the refuge. They have to be um, referred to your organization. Right. But what right. is the national number? The national hotline. hotline. So if you suspect someone's being trafficked or if you are being trafficked yourself, then the national hotline is 888-373-7888. Or a person can text H-E-L-P, help, 
to 233-733, and that's a very discreet way to report that you're being trafficked and get help. Excellent, thank you. I really appreciate all of you bringing your voice and your experience to the table today. So what have we learned today? Let's start with the bad news. The sexual and commercial exploitation of our young people is a very real challenge in Central Texas with almost 80,000 victims, and that is a conservative number according to the recent study out by the University of Texas. We'll post a link to the full report on our website for those interested in learning more. But there is also good news. Today, we've met some strong leaders, real warriors in the fight to reclaim freedom and opportunity for victims of sex trafficking in Texas. If you want more information or think you might be interested in supporting the efforts of these organizations and others, we've posted a number of helpful links and resources on our website. It's at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society or find us on Facebook and continue the conversation at facebook.com slash civil society TV. Until next time, I'm Julie Niehoff. Thank you to my guests today. Thank you to Austin Community College and thank you for watching Civil Society.